Hello, good afternoon. Welcome. Thanks for being with us today, either on site or online. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Lonike van der Plaas. Lonike is leading the Computation, Cognition, and Language Group at EDIAP Research Center in Martigny. She's also an associate professor in affiliation with the University of Malta. Her talk today is titled Towards Creative Systems with Linguistic Modeling. We have in total one hour of time. Alonika told me she planned for 45 minutes yeah. uh, of the talk, and then we have 15 minutes to address uh, any questions you might have. Urgent questions uh, can be asked in the course of the presentation. Before diving into the presentation, I'd like to thank the team once again for preparing this seminar and Lonike for her availability. The floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so here's a kind of a roadmap of what I'd like to do today. So yes, my name is Lonke van der Plaas. I'm from IDIAP, the research institute, about one hour away from here, uh, closer to the mountains, actually, than you are. Um, so I'll start, uh, well, it will be about creativity, especially computational creativity. And um, I'm going to afterwards look a little bit into uh, computational linguistic creativity. So any kind of computational creativity that is uh, uh, using linguistics expressions. Um, I'm going to talk a little about uh, limitations of current AI to motivate my research. And then in the end, you see there are two uh, main things that I'm going to talk about today. And those are two uh, previous works that I've done. One already quite some time ago, the predicting novel concepts, and the other very recently, it's actually just got accepted uh, this weekend as a, a publication. Good. So a little bit about me, I thought, because uh, maybe a lot of you don't know me. So I'm currently, as I said, at IDIAP in, in Martigny, and I'm also associate professor at the University of Malta, where I was before I came here. Um, I did a junior professorship at the University of Stuttgart in the uh, Natural Language Processing Lab there, which is a very big institution. Um, before that, um, I did uh, my PhD at the University of Groningen and a postdoc at the University of Geneva. And it all started at the University of Cambridge, where I did an MPhil in computer speech and language processing. So, uh, yes, we have uh, the Computation, Cognition and Language Group, which I'm heading at IDIAP. And uh, what we're doing there is we're looking at some of the boundaries of current AI systems with respect to language. So it's always linguistic, lang linguistics and language that we're focusing on, uh, or as you might also know the term of natural language processing. So two aspects of that is uh, what we are mostly interested in. One is about cross-lingual transfers. So we think that um, we shouldn't have just uh, lang uh, language technologies for uh, English and one of the other main uh, languages of the world where most of the economic prosperity is going on. But there is a lot of languages in the world and all of these uh, people will also want to benefit from uh, technologies. And therefore we, uh, we like to focus on cross-lingual transfer so that we can create uh, language technologies for other types of languages in the world. And if possible, by using uh, in, like um, clever machine learning methods, so we don't have to use lots and lots of annotated material, which is very expensive. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, which you can also see in the, in the name already, Cognition and Language Group, we want to uh, focus also on modeling human cognitive abilities, and especially those that are currently underexposed in systems. And uh, one of those is creativity. You see, Members of my group, so yes, I'm heading it. Then there's Laura Vasquez, who's a postdoc who started one month ago. There's uh, Molly Peterson, who's been with me already for uh, a year now. She's a PhD student, co-supervised by Antoine Boslu, who's in the NLP lab here. And Mete Ismail Zada is also a PhD student who recently started, also uh, co-supervised uh, together with uh, Antoine Boslu. And then there's Vincent Jung, uh, who's an intern in the group. Great. So let's talk a little bit about creativity. It's a, it's a, difficult, uh, a difficult term, actually. It's very hard to define what creativity is. But we do see it used all of the time. So, for example, you might see things like, we need new ideas to solve our country's pressing problems, or we need workers who can think outside of the box, especially in science and technology, to be competitive in today's global economy, all hinting at, at, at creativity. And if you look at the LinkedIn learning, they determine the skills that companies need most based on their internal data. And creativity is on the top of the list there. 
So what is, what is creativity when you think about it? Yeah, um, what do you think creativity is? Well, maybe you think that's to do with uh, geniuses or geniuses. Maybe people that create very nice new paintings uh, like Vincent van Gogh, maybe that is also creativity, yeah, artistic expression. Uh, how about our own creativity? Maybe you don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it, this one, but somebody was creative, right, behind it. Uh, or, you know, some kind of recipe that may turn out well or not so well, but maybe the first time that anybody ever tried to make such a cake. So all types of creativity. And the other thing, which is maybe more um, close to what we are doing on a daily basis, is when you come up with a new research uh, idea, you have a new hypothesis you want to test, and you're like, yes, that's great, let's do that. Nobody's done that before. That's also creativity. So how do we define it now? Maybe you thought even of other things, not the things that I mentioned. Well, as a general um, definition, we can say that creativity is the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising, but also valuable. Because if I just drop uh, my coffee and there's a stain on the floor, it's probably very new. Nobody's seen that before. The shape is very different, but it's not very valuable and uh, therefore not a creative artifact. Um, now, the value of something uh, that is new and surprising is dependent on time and context. Even a mobile phone, when first time somebody came up with this idea, wasn't seen as something that was worthwhile thinking about, right? And afterwards, it became such a success. There's also the democratization of creativity. Before, people were more thinking, oh, creativity, that's something for the geniuses. But now people seem to accept that creativity is actually something that we all have, more or less. And um, creativity is therefore an aspect of human intelligence. And interestingly now, in the third wave, people have uh, often said that the prime spill of human beings in the future post-information society is actually creativity because all the other things are taken care of by computers. And then come I and I say, oh, let's also try and see if creativity can be done by computers. It's quite mean. <laughs> what is this wave? Sorry? Sorry, what is that wave? It's the third wave of Ah, okay, that is just that currently we are what they call the third wave, which means uh, it's, it's like you're going through uh, stages in time where certain abilities of humans are more valued than others. And the third wave is, I don't know why it was called the third wave, but anyway, this is where it's no longer, uh, you know, looking up information isn't valued as much as it used to be. Before it was like, oh, humans, they can look up information, but now we have machines to do that. But creativity is something where they say we still need. Uh, computational systems. Okay, so computational creativity then. So that is the art, science, philosophy and engineering of computational systems which, by taking on particular responsibilities, exhibit behaviours that unbiased observers would deem to be creative. Well, this definition is uh, used by these people, but I find it a little bit, you know, <laughs> it doesn't tell us very much. It's like whatever we think is creative, right? So you see that people are struggling with defining it. Well, let's look a little bit at the history then. So computational creativity is a subfield of AI, and the first attempt at a theoretical foundation was done by Margaret Bowden. And she distinguished P creativity from age creativity. So P creativity is psychological creativity, which is more to do with any individual who comes up with an idea that is new to them. So if you come up with something and you're like, whoa, I never thought of that before, now I have this idea, that's uh, P creativity. Now, age creativity is a historical creativity. You can imagine that's a much bigger thing, which means somebody came up with something that nobody else before ever came up with. So that be became a very important thing in history. And then there's also these three types of creativity that uh, show in how far we have to search and how, how difficult we have to, uh, what difficult procedures we have to do to come up with something creative. Combinatorial is the easiest one. You're just combining things that you already know in new ways. And then exploratory is where you go a little bit out of the boundaries of what you've seen before. And transformational creativity is where you really change the search space itself. So in my talk, I'm only going, I'm going to be very modest. I'm staying in the combinatorial uh, type of uh, creativity. A little bit about uh, how people see this as a, uh, as a field of, of uh, how this will grow. Uh, it's actually at the same level as chatbots, for example, where there's actually much more, many more people working on chatbots than there are people working on computational creativity. This is just, I you always use this slide to convince people to work on computational creativity because it's still a bit of a niche. It's becoming more, but when I started with this uh, 
when I was at the University of Malta, everybody was telling me, what, why are you interested in this? And then I would like to convince people that it's actually something that's worthwhile. Now with generative AI, of course, things have changed. So um, this is a paper in the International uh, Competition of Creativity uh, Conference where they looked at the papers that you see. So the good thing about computational creativity is that it is young, but it is expanding. And uh, they have also this dedicated community and this conference. And if you look at the application domains, you see that uh, there is uh, logic, NLP, image, music, concept, and not, I don't know, other and none are not very informative. But for the others, we can see that NLP takes up a large space of the, the work on the applications that people have used for computational creativity. So I'll be focusing on NLP since that's text, but there are also people working on music and image and uh, approaches that have to do with logic. So if we look at computational linguistic creativity, what kind of types of research do we find there? There's been in the past few years, a lot of, um, well, a lot of, most of the research in linguistic creativity was about creating output, creating linguistic output that is creative. For example, you can create stories, you can create uh, poetry, uh, there was a lot of systems actually in poetry generation, or generating humor, generating puns, uh, there, you can generate metaphors or new concepts. Uh, but more recently, actually, people have kind of stepped a bit away from these outputs, creative outputs, and look more at what are the general abilities of creative thinking that we can see, for example, in large language models. And what people have done typically here is that they took a psychological test that is used to test creativity in humans, and then they use that to test, human, uh, to test the, the, the creativity of systems as well. And they see how well these large language models do the task. And there are several problems with that, and I'll come back to that later. So a little bit about the limitations of current AI, because this is what actually drove me uh, to work on this. And um, then when I had the first uh, time that I, I, I started getting interested in this, I also met with uh, some people in the University of Zurich, and we started developing the idea that we actually need computational creativity in AI. So we all know that the recent, like if we could look at NLP, uh, the trend has been to feed more and more data to systems. Uh, and we've had impressive results on several tasks, but there's a lot of people that also made us aware of the limitation of these systems. They showed us that they can be very brittle, they can be broken in, in certain circumstances by just small, small changes. They need a lot of data and, and, and also because they need so much data, it's very hard to um, make sure that the data that goes in is all nicely screened and that there's no biases in there. So these systems will become biased and they can also produce therefore harmful content. There's also the lack of interpretability. But one thing that maybe hasn't been looked at so much because a lot of people are focusing on robustness is that there's also this problem of narrowness and non-flexibility and non-diverse output. So if you, if you look at, uh, and this is work that I've done with this philosopher that was at the University of Zurich when I was there for a research fellowship, uh, we looked at creative process. And then we said, in, in general, if you look at, um, for example, market dynamics, but or cultural revolution, uh, cultural evolution, you, you see that there may be some harmful mutations, but they allow species to adapt to changing circumstances. The same for market dynamics. People uh, start a restaurant and uh, because they think it's a great idea, but many restaurants actually don't survive. But the fact that people have crazy ideas and try things is how we learn and how we get also innovation. Now, on the other hand, if we don't have these humans taking decisions anymore, and more and more we're relying on intelligent systems, which are trained on not making mistakes, you can imagine that we get a bit, yeah, these narrowly defined objective functions will not have the same exploration power as a system that's based on individual judgments. And also we'll have fewer agents that take over the decision-making that was previously done by many more individuals. So there will be less diverse outcomes. And if you then realize that these agents are actually trained on the data that they see as evidence around them, if they are training on their own decisions, it, it will be more and more impoverished the, the further we go. So the more and more, uh, yeah, the, the decisions will become, make this world in, in a way a more boring place. We won't have people making decisions based on gut feeling or on some crazy ideas. 
So what we actually need for a creative process to work is some kind of randomness and undirected, non fully rationally directed processes. We need variance, we need diversity. And of course, there will be costs because of that. Uh, but these costs will also help us to expand our knowledge. And what we have to accept is that the part has to be sacrificed for the whole. So if we look at ChatGPT now, uh, and in this, this work, well, I did that with this philosopher before ChatGPT, and we were more thinking of um, systems that, for example, do candidate selection uh, uh, for, for jobs, for example, that they would always go for the safest choice, which means you won't get diverse uh, workforce. But if you look at ChatGPT, uh, it's, it's great, it can help us do a lot of tasks more efficiently, uh, but it is also very biased towards the training data. And if you think of the fact that the language that it's trained on is mostly the English language and all the cultural biases that are part of that, you can see that even if you talk to it in your own language, ima imagine you talking to it in, I don't know, Arabic and uh, African language, if that's possible, or even in French. There will be these cultural biases behind it that are not belonging to your culture, but you still take them as input, use them, and so it's a problem, I think. Uh, there will be more standardization also. It's exactly why people love it, because they say, oh, finally I can write correctly. I was so afraid to write in French, but now I can, and I just use what comes out of that. But you, you lose also some aspects of there. And it will also get more impoverished, because it will keep training on what it finds on the web. And we're feeling that with a lot of what it itself created. Right? So I see some problems there. And this is why I thought, um, but that's what made me do this first uh, study that I'm going to talk to you about now, predicting novel concepts. So this is work that I've been doing while well, we started in 2019, some time ago already with uh, Prajit Dar. And then Inga Lang came when I was uh, at IDIAP and Vincent Jung is currently working with me on the same topic still and trying to see if we can make this work for other languages such as French. So what is our idea here? So we, we thought that compounds, and compound is a thing from linguistics, maybe you've never heard of it. It's a formation of a new lexeme or a new word by adjoining two or more words. And examples here are hotel room, screen time, you're just putting screen and time together, flight schedule, website, and carbon footprint. So what these things do, they allow us to do conceptual recombination. So it's one of the three creativities, right? So from leisure time, something that was known already for a long time, we go to screen time, something that's actually quite new and is very much related to our current uh, world, right? Where people spend too much time looking at their screens. The amphibian footprint, which was an actual footprint, goes to the memory footprint. And then lately, everybody's talking about carbon footprints. So we're using these concepts to describe new ideas and, and um, it's very productive. Children do this all the time. If you, if you see, if you happen to talk to children, just, just pay attention and you'll see that they come up with very strange combinations of words all the time. Uh, they're very common, but they have a very low token count. So we don't have a lot of examples per uh, compound. And the relationship between the components is often underspecified. So you can have a war canoe, which is a canoe made for war, and a glass canoe that is a canoe made of glass. So here we see some of the patterns that are used when you co combine things in new ways. And, and by looking at that, we thought, hey, this is something that computers can do, can do as well. If you think of laminated wood, it was used by the ancient Egyptians, patented in 1865. And then laminated glass, how did they come to that? That was patented in 1909. Well, because wood and glass are both materials, they're both fragile and we want, would like to make it stronger. So it's a good idea to put them together. So can we learn something like that using, uh, using computational methods? Well, the good thing is there's data. We have the emergence and the success of new concepts across time in these time-stamped corpora, such as Google Ngrams, Google Books Corpus. And there you see, for example, that food crisis was there all the time. You see the frequency, how many times people use food crisis. And then you see climate crisis only appearing later on. And the same for our example of laminated wood. It took off already earlier, uh, but laminated glass came after that and was a much bigger success, much more used by people. And of course, the famous example of the mobile phone. People were carrying around radios for a long time, but the mobile phone was the actual thing that... So, Maybe we can model this uh, way that compounds are generated. A glass bottom boat, for example, is found in early corpora, but not the glass canoe. But we can infer that a glass canoe is a plausible concept because of the semantic similarity between a boat and a canoe. 
And how can we do that? Well, we can use word embeddings, vector-based representations of the constituents, and then we can model their combination using machine learning methods. So why these dense vector representations? So we all know that these are great because they uh, smooth the distribution, they add generalization power, and this helps because we never have enough corpora, so we have a remedy for data sparseness. But they don't only cater for unseen events, they are also an opportunity to create truly novel, truly unseen things, but uh, that are still plausible combinations. And if we look at cognitive science, we see that the semantic networks of highly creative individuals, they compare them with not so creative individuals, and they've shown that they have actually different structures. So for people that are more creative, it's easier to connect things that are actually far away. So maybe we can condense the space, make a shorter uh, paths there and, and come up with creative things. So in practice, what did we do? We just took this timestamp corpus and we said, we take one part to get our word embeddings from, the first part till 2010. So we have word embeddings, we can look also at trends, like how important are words. Uh, and then we have to still, I mean, we then know what the meaning is of an individual constituent, but the combination to train a model to learn what are good combinations, we need good and bad examples. As good examples, we took everything we found in a corpus. For example, coffee machine is something we found. And as bad examples, we just uh, kind of corrupted these good examples. So coffee machine, we replaced machine with something else randomly and made sure it wasn't found in the, in the data set, right? And then we had coffee mouse, which was a bad example. And then we trained our model to learn what are good, good combinations. And then the last part of our corpus, we never saw it, neither uh, for the training of the classifier, neither for the word embeddings. And we evaluated on that part of the corpus to see if it could predict new ideas correctly. So with a little bit more detail here, we use word to vec so then we use uh, we use the word of fact representations plus these uh, positive and negative examples to train this neural network model that then, uh, based on a list of compounds that we see in the last decade, we, we, we give it bad, corrupted ones that are the bad examples, and then we ask it to disambiguate. So it's just a disambiguator. That's one setup. We get here 69.4% accuracy, but this accuracy, it doesn't mean that much. I'll show you later with some examples why. We can also do an actual generation where we say we take these examples from the development set and we generate compounds by replacing one of the, th the two constituents by a semantically similar word, in this case, the modifier, the first one. So uh, coffee machine uh, and computer, uh, coffee computer, for example. Uh, and then so we have here a generator uh, that generates these things. And then we also evaluate that using our neural network models to see if the combination is a plausible well, it makes much more sense to look at examples because um, just evaluating on the, la the latest timestamp data isn't always the best thing to do. It's the only thing we could do uh, instead of, well, except for asking humans what they thought about this. But uh, yeah, it's, it still only gives you an indication because here you see what is found in the evaluation set in the last decades. Uh, oh no, the last uh, four years, we have your five years. Um, we see um, things like, Software school, township law, evidence need. These are things that are found in this last ti uh, timestamp data, but it's not actually uh, correctly uh, identified by the system. You see what is predicted by the system in red. So in the middle are things that it predicted and they are found. So these are counted as correct, but all the other things are counted as incorrect in our, uh, for our accuracy. And uh, what is a pity is that some of the things that are predicted by the system but not found in the evaluation set are actually quite good examples, right? Riesling saw so nothing wrong with that, yeah? What is the evaluation? Here we're just looking at uh, what our system predicts based on seeing only the first part of the corpus uh, with only the timestamp until 2015 and trying to see if it can predict the new terms that we find in the last bit of our corpus, which we've never seen, which is the future, let's say, for the, for the model. And then you see what the system predicts and what is found in the evaluation set. And then uh, you see. So these words in the evaluation set haven't appeared in the history before 2015? No, not at all, no. So it comes up with things like Riesling sauce just because it's seen some other sauce with some kind of wine. <laughs> and it comes up with that. Cheeseburger spread is because it's seen hamburger spread, I guess. 
uh, Kevlar jacket. I'm not sure exactly how it came there. That's one thing we want to uh, look a bit more into. Uh, the waistband blouse with boy food, healthcare burden, all perfectly fine things that it came up with, never seen. Hashi's store as well. But then there are also some weird ones like brain sculpting and uh, knee length glove. You can see that it has an idea, but not quite uh, exactly what it should know. The light emitting lamp also sounds maybe a bit, you know, <laughs> what do you do with a lamp that doesn't emit light? Somebody said it is actually used sometimes, but I don't know. Uh, the melting cloud and the misrepresentation campaign. So, but still, you see that if you, if you take those all as mistakes and these all as mistakes, you're a bit a little bit harsh on the system. That's what I wanted to show. And I also wanted to show that if you look into, uh, if you use Google to just think like brain sculpting, what is that? Well, there are people sculpting a brain, of course. But also, which I didn't think of is this way, the metaphorical use of brain sculpting, eh? brain sculpting for business, change, innovation, and performance enhancement. Melting cloud, uh, well, it inspires somebody to make a t-shirt, so maybe uh, a system that creates these things is not so bad. And uh, the, even the knee length gloves are there, but that is because there was a, probably a mistake in the machine translation. <laughs> so, and then if we combine, compare that with ChatGPT, right, which uh, a lot of people say, oh, generative AI is so great for creativity and all that, but if you ask it for melting cloud, it is very, it says it doesn't correspond to any established concept or phenomenon in meteorology, physics, or any scientific field. So, yes, it just it does say that it might be a metaphorical use of the term, right? But it's not the, the perfect tool to come up with new ideas, I think. So after we've done all this work, we said we, we I wrote about well, I've actually written a couple of project proposals, but this is the first one that got accepted when I came here in Switzerland. Uh, uh, it's a Swiss National Science Foundation, two PhD students working on that for four years. And here we want to go from just these two word concepts to more complex ideas, have a um, look at creative problem solving, analogical reasoning, and these sort of things. And we also want to include cross domain and cross lingual models to uh, be able to see if you just like traveling, right? If you travel to another country, you, you come up with new ideas because you just see things that are similar, but yet a little bit different from what you're used to. And the same when you have cross-disciplinary research uh, going on, you see people come up with new ideas because they're not in your field and they think a little bit out of the box. So we want to try and see if we can create models that do exactly this and help us um, become more creative. So the current preoccupation, so what are we currently thinking about in the group, things that haven't been solved? Well, analogical reasoning, we have some nice results, and I'll show them to you in a bit in the next few slides that are coming up. But the other thing that we're doing, and, and uh, PhD student Mete, who I just uh, also uh, showed this picture before, he's looking also at, uh, yeah, what kind of data sets do we actually have to uh, train and evaluate uh, the creative abilities of AI systems. Um, sometimes people have used these, uh, these tests that are used to uh, determine the creativity of individuals. And I've done actually a semester project or uh, with one of the students here from the EPFL and we were trying this out as well. And we found out that actually it may not always be a very suitable way to test machines in this way because there is a correlation between the remote associate test, which is you have two words and now come up with a third word or just three words, I forgot, but come up with a third word that actually combines or the fourth word that combines the three before. And humans have quite some trouble with that because they have to think of, you know, this word, this word, this word, what do they have in common? And what would, could be a fourth word? And, you know, you have to think and yes, it, it, you have to explore your lexicon or uh, go inside your brain and, and look around. But for uh, a system that is actually trained on co-occurrences, it's not so hard, actually, this, this word, this uh, is not so hard. And so the correlation between other creative behaviors for humans, there is a correlation between the output of this text and uh, the output of the, um, what these humans do, but for computers, that's not a given. So yeah, we have to be careful also because a lot of these, uh, psychological tests are actually available online. So these, these uh, large language models have already seen the answers. So we have to be very careful. Good, then we thought maybe we can look into creative problem solving. So um, we could perhaps may have a look into the, these uh, common benchmarks for question answering and see if sometimes 
the questions that are asked maybe already require some form of creativity. Um, so we could look at common benchmarks and, and to see in how far creativity is needed. Uh, we could also create data sets in a controlled fashion by really thinking what is for us creativity and how can we put that in a data set in a controlled fashion or maybe we can use some real world data and if you have any ideas I'm very very yeah, interested to hear from you. Uh, I was thinking already maybe we could do recipes and their alternatives like it's, it's, it's there's some creativity in that right I want to bake a a banana cake, but I have no bananas. <laughs> what do I do? Uh, these kind of questions. Or I want to make a low fat uh, butter cake. Yeah, what do I do? Um, another thing, maybe people in help desks, they have to solve difficult uh, problems that people may have. Or maybe people in emergency situations where somebody is out in the wild and says, Oh, I have a bleeding wound, I have to do something about it, but I have no cloth or anything, what you do. These are creative ways of solving problems, but I, I have yet to find a, a, a good data set for that. The other thing we could look at is scientific hypothesis generation. There we have a lot of data. We have a lot of papers and people refer to each other so we can find out how they came to new ideas. So maybe uh, that is a nice data set to, to look at. Good. So then we reached the the last bit or the, the last paper that, um, that I would like to present uh, after this one uh, on novel concepts, and that is about learning analogical reasoning. So this is work that has just uh, you know, been accepted this, this, uh, this weekend, and I'm very happy because it came uh, as a, in the main session of the EMNLP conference, uh, which is a very good conference in our, in our field. And uh, this was worked by Molly uh, Peterson and by me, and um, let's have a look what the motivation was. So analogies are very useful and they are useful for a variety of applications. Think only of education. You often use, for example, a metaphor to explain something and then all of a sudden people see, click something, right? It's a very good way of doing, uh, educating people, helping them to understand complex things by drawing a link to something more simple. And it also plays a role in creative thinking. So there has been interest in analogies in the NLP literature, but mostly to show the knowledge that is contained in embedded. So if you look at what is an analogy, so that's something like A is to B as C is to D. For example, planet is to sun as electron is to nucleus. So what are the aims of, of, of this paper? We said, well, if you look at previous work, they've often used things that they've called analogies, but they're not really the kind of analogies that we really think of when we think of analogical reasoning. Um, these ones are the BATS and the Google Analogy Test Set, and they only represent a small subset of types of analogies, and these are really not representative on, of analogical reasoning. So what we did is, first of all, we used a varied set of analogies that are human, used in human testing. So they're real analogies used in human tests. And the other thing is we said, well, it's interesting to look at word embeddings as they currently are and then trying to see if they have analogical uh, information in there. But uh, could this actually be something that can be learned? Can we make these embeddings be more susceptible to relational knowledge instead of only looking at similarity, similarity between words? Can they also look at relations like planet is to sun, the relation between planet and sun, as electron is to nucleus, the relation between the two? So we try to see that as well. So for the first aim, this more relevant and challenging uh, analogy uh, data types, um, on the left-hand side, you see analogy that is used in previous work in NLP. Uh, for example, they say entertain, entertainer. Uh, entertain is to entertainer as examine is to examiner. Love to loves, hate to hates. Man is to king as women is to queen. Uh, man is to princess, woman is to princess. You've met, you probably have seen these, right? Exact, uh, especially the, the one with uh, man and king and women and woman and queen. I think this is a very known one. So these can kind of be grouped in collections of many pairs with equivalent relations. So uh, you can have like more for syntactic um, rules or you can have uh, the gender dimension, right? So you can kind of group them and you can then also verbalize for each example what the relation actually is. Now, the ones that we wanted to look at are the so-called 
psychometric analogy tests. And one of an example of that is the scan test that was first presented by Usho et al. So here you see a more complex construct. The solar system is compared to the atom, and there are multiple things in there that actually relate to each other. These are harvests from text, and they are used, uh, most of the data we used is really tested on analogical reasoning and vocabulary sizes of humans. Now, it's not that these are mutually exclusive. We also have some examples in our data sets that we can find also in the Google Analogy test set, but at least we also have a larger variety of things. And then about analogy learning, that was the second aim, right? Not just looking into uh, embeddings, but also looking at whether we can learn analogies. So analogies are often used as a means to evaluate embeddings per se. And there people would say like, if I do B minus A plus D, and I figure out what comes out of that, that should be the solution D. So for example, sun minus planet plus electron is should be nucleus, or king minus man plus woman should be queen. This is what people have tried to do with word embedding and find out if the solutions were actually matching what the, the gold standard said. Uh, we're gonna, gonna try and learn relational knowledge and then for these more complex analogies. So we're going to change the objective function based on cosine similarity of the relations. And we have two variations for that. And we're going to train by means of a simple classifier on top of BERT. So transformer based, uh, simple model BERT base. And then we have uh, also some baselines because we want to see if training actually helps, if fine tuning helps in this case. And so we have two variations of BERT. And then we have fast text as a, a model that is known to work very well on out of a, like uh, has a large vocabulary, so should do very well on these uh, tests that we have. So what are the training data that we use? We had four English language data sets, the SCAN, the Scientific and Creative Analogy data set, the SET US uh, College at, uh, or SAT US College Admissions and the UTU4, also from an English learning website. Most of the data developed to test humans and Sinchel, oh, sorry, that this fell off, but Sinchel et al. found that a model fine-tuned on the bats performed worse on scan data uh, than if you, uh, you didn't fine-tune it at all. So it, it shows that actually the bats is a very specific type of analogies. So um, these analogies were probably very different and therefore not represent well how humans uh, use analogies. Oh, yes, another bat. Um, so if we look at the training data characteristics, the um, set U2 and uh, U4 are all pairs of pairs, and they contain positive and negative examples, and they are known to be very challenging for humans. And the scan data set contains analogies between two concepts. As you can see, there are multiple elements in there, and we created negative entities by means of shuffling, so we did that ourselves. So what do you get when you do that? Uh, you see for the scan data, we have nucleus, electron, Nucleus is to electron and sun is to planet as a positive example, and then a negative one, nucleus is to electron as traveler is to station, which doesn't make sense. And for the other one, we just use what the, the data has as also for testing humans. If you look at the out of vocabulary words, you see that the scan actually uses quite, uh, you know, highly frequent words, but uh, the SAT is, has a, quite a number of out of vocabulary items, which means it's really there to test the vocabulary uh, size of humans, right? So uh, how well are you uh, at English? So how, how, how well can you speak English? Um, and this is why, what we also see. So this is also challenging for our systems, of course. So what are the models that we use? So as I said, we wanted to change the system so that it could learn analogies. And we use the SBIRT architecture that is uh, very well known as the sentence bird, which is known to work well for sentence embeddings. And then we pooled instead at the word level instead of at the sentence level. And the learning objective that we use, as you could see here, is uh, that we try to make for the positive examples, the cosine and similarity between A minus C and B minus D as similar as, as, as high as possible, right? Because this is what we, we are after. We want the model to learn uh, how uh, the structure of these analogies. Then because we did some additional experiments, because actually, Analogies are permutable. You can turn things around. So we didn't just look at uh, the A uh, minus B uh, and then uh, B minus C, but we also looked at A minus C and B minus D to just check if that reordering had something 
uh, as a change. And then we had the simple bird classifier as well. So uh, that just taking bird, not as bird in this case, and trying to see whether it predicts a zero or a one for um, these uh, negative and positive examples. And then we had our baseline. So for every a bird, a, uh, the S bird architecture of AB fine tuned, we had so also a non tuned version to see if learning made any difference. And also for AC, the other um, order, we had the same, also a non tuned version. And then we had the bird simple classifier, as I said, and fast text, which have not much to do with each other. So we can do a controlled experiment, but just two more things to, to test. And here are some results. So on top, you see all of our baselines. So these are the fast text model and the BERT uh, non-tuned and the BERT AC non-tuned. Uh, and this is all on the different test sets. You see an overall um, uh, performance, this is accuracy. Uh, and then you have the different test sets below that. So the SAT, UTU4, and the SCAN, the one that has uh, science and metaphors in there, science analogies and metaphors. And you can see that there's a big difference actually between uh, the two that we are mostly interested in, the BERT AB non-tuned and the BERT AB uh, tuned. You see that we go up from uh, 52 for the overall to uh, 40, I don't think it's right. <laughs> so 0 0.2 to 0 0.72 for the overall uh, performance. And you can see that uh, Everything that's bold is statistically significant, and the arrows uh, show whether we go up or we go down from the previous results. Now, the, on the positive examples, we do go down, but um, in general, we do so much better on the negative examples because the previous models were just not doing well at all on the negative examples. Uh, so that in, in total, we're doing much better overall. And the same for BERT AC, but it's just not as, performing as well as the original. Uh, order that we had with BERT AB. Time left. So um, we also wanted to look at out of domain testing. So we've trained our models to do well on these analogies. And we've shown that on a held out test that if we do, in that case, we just held out 10% and we did this uh, post validation. That worked really well. But how does it do when we take another data set that was really constructed for humans, for which we also know how well humans do on that, what do, do our systems do? So these people are in the psychology department, they compiled a controlled list of analogies and their distractors, and they tested whether the similarity between entities in the pairs affect a human's ability to correctly solve analogies. So they try to really fool people by giving them uh, analogies where they permuted it just a little bit so that it's very similar in semantic um, similarity. Um, and this is very much in line with previous work from the NLP literature where people say the model performance on analogy tests tend to rely heavily on how semantically related the entities and the analogies are to each other. So these people try to do something about that and this is how they presented, the, uh, how they made up the data. So they had analogies just like before, A is to B as C is to question mark. And for the question mark, people had to choose between two words. One is the correct one, and one is a bad example. And the way they constructed the bad examples was very uh, intelligent, I think. So on the one hand, they had these, what they call high distractor salience items. For example, you have tarantula is to spider as B is to, and then uh, the correct one is insect, and then the false one is hive. But insect and hive are very semantically similar, so people get confused. Then we have the other one where it is uh, the same, but on the end we have yellow, which is the, the much less uh, semantically similar to insect or related to, to insect than uh, hive is. They also categorize analogies by the similarity between the relation between A, B, and C, D as near and far analogies. And they had some relation types. We can't go into that because, yeah, you have to read that, their paper. We didn't find anything in our computational methods that were interesting there. What did they find? Humans were doing quite well on solving these analogies, not 100%, quite, quite a difficult task, 84% accuracy overall. And they're better at solving near analogies where the semantic relation is more similar than far analogies. And they had a harder time when they had a high distractor salience as compared to the low distractor salience. So we use this data and we could compare our model's performance directly with human competence that way. 
So here are the results. Um, as you can see, um, we're doing uh, human performances at 84. We are at 72, so we're not uh, doing very badly there. And uh, we're doing much better than uh, the BERT uh, non-tuned versions. And uh, again, AB is better than uh, non-tuned. Oh, I think I got the wrong results here. Sorry about that. This should have been another table. <laughs> I'm not sure I can find this, but the results were again that we could say we were about 12% below the, 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 the upper bound from um, the human performance. And we showed again that learning, actually, training helped uh, uh, over the, the baselines that were non tuned. So the last thing we did is we checked whether fine tuning on analogy tasks leads to deterioration of embeddings for other tasks, because there's something known as catastrophic forgetting. And so we took a semantic similarity task where you just have to say whether words are semantically similar or not. And we thought if we train them for analogical reasoning, will these models do much worse after we've, um, we've, we've, we've have, uh, used them for this particular training scheme? And the good news is that they actually don't do much worse in certain cases, while the BERT models actually improve after the fine tuning, but still uh, BERT models are not the best to do such semantic similarity tasks. So you're better off using fast text as is already known in the literature. So some conclusions uh, and some limitations also from what we've done. So uh, analogies, also more relevant and challenging uh, types of analogies, are something that can be learned by machine learning methods. Uh, we reach an accuracy from of 0.72 up from 0.53, while being about 12% uh, below the human upper bound, uh, 0 0.12 um, below the human upper bound on an unseen test set that is really constructed to test human analogical reasoning. Well, the conclusion, the, what we have to say about the limitations here, that we used small data sets, so we can't really say that we've proven now that uh, this is actually something that can be learned. Uh, it's still not a lot of data and permutations of analogies are also not without criticism. So the way, the way we change the AB to AC in practice, I mean, if you look at it in a logical way, it's possible, but uh, you can see in the paper that there's actually also some doubts about uh, doing that. So that was it for me. Thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, today I've talked to you about creativity, computational creativity, um, and the linguistic aspects of that. Uh, I've looked at some limitations of current AI that uh, uh, led me to, uh, un to look into this uh, topic. And I've shown you two different uh, papers that we did in previous times, one on predicting novel compounds uh, co concepts and the other on learning analogical reasoning for uh, our most recent paper. And thanks a lot. <laughs> Just some words of closing for my side. Okay. Thank you very much, yeah. Lonica, you. for your talk today. And we are looking forward to see you all again if you're interested for next talks. The next one is on the 30th of October with Professor Janina Schkel. And on the 13th of November with Professor Masha Schwaran. The 4th of December, looking forward to see Pascal, who actually comes back after three years. He shows us the updates at SwissCAD which is a national initiative for uh, AI for catalysis. And then on December 11th, we're looking forward to welcome Professor Berend Smith. This will be our last talk for this year. So thank you once again for having been with us. I'm looking forward to seeing you all soon again. Goodbye.